Several years ago, we did a video looking at Sino-Soviet relations in the 1950s and the lead up to the eventual Sino-Soviet split. It's a pretty decent video if we do say so ourselves. In the Cold War timeline, that brought us to the early 1960s, and we figured now was as good a time as any to come back to Sino-Soviet relations. Now, this is a substantial topic with a ton of events that we want to take a look at, but we figured we would do an overview of all of this first as that helps us, and hopefully you, to frame the individual events as they then take place and as we cover them. I'm your host David, and this week we return to Sino-Soviet relations in the post-split era. This is the Cold War. I have never been a big fan of camping, but all of that could be about to change thanks to Omaze, the sponsor of today's video. Be sure to stay tuned for more about Omaze later on in this video. So when we last left our heroes, the Soviet Union and China had broken off formal diplomatic relations. This was an action that took place in the wake of Soviet support for India in the 1962 Sino-Indian War, as well as Chinese disdain for Moscow's refusal to actually go to war with the United States during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mao had little to no respect for Khrushchev and saw Moscow as having given up leadership of the revolutionary struggle, which naturally then passed to Beijing. What followed then was a two-year campaign where both Beijing and Moscow waged propaganda campaigns against each other, each trying to demonstrate that they were the real representatives of true communism, the standard bearers of Marxism-Leninism. The Chinese very much took the lead in this campaign, with the party publishing numerous letters and articles criticizing the Soviet Union for its recently taken position on peaceful coexistence. They accused Khrushchev of revisionism, calling his position phony communism. They also attacked Yugoslavia, questioning if it was even a socialist state. In general, while criticizing others, they defended their own position vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet one. Mao went so far as to claim a counter-revolution had taken place in the USSR, and that capitalism was being established there, not socialism. And it wasn't just Khrushchev that was the problem. Even after Nikita's ouster in 1964, Beijing continued its criticisms. While they recognized that Brezhnev was a new leader and was more hardline in his communism than Khrushchev had been, Leonid Ilyich still pursued an agenda of peaceful coexistence with the West. This was the real objection, and relations between China and the Soviet Union remained frosty. But the split wasn't just a propaganda war. There was actual fighting that went along with it, primarily focused on a border dispute. The border conflict that emerged had been simmering for decades, but the split allowed it to really boil over. 1964 had actually almost seen an agreement arrive to to settle a firm border along the Asuri River, including an island which the Soviets claimed as Damansky Island, while the Chinese claimed it as Zhenbao Island. The agreement would have seen the island become undisputed Chinese territory, but some anti-Soviet statements that Mao made in private to the Japanese Communist Party in July of 1964 were leaked to the press, and Khrushchev, not yet ousted, was enraged to the point he cancelled the proposed border agreement. The border disagreement escalated through the decade, with both sides slowly amassing troops on each side of the line. 1966 saw the CCP escalate the matter, stating that the demarcation line was one that had been forced on China during the 19th century. While there was no call for a modification of the border, there was a demand that the Soviet Union formally acknowledge the unfairness of the border treaties. This demand was simply ignored. As tensions mounted, both sides evaluated their war plans. The Soviets saw themselves as having the technological edge in a war against China, especially as a result of their nuclear arsenal, but it was well recognized that China had the advantage of sheer manpower. Mao's theories of warfare did recognize that technological advancement and economic power were important, but postulated that ultimately wars were won by people and that, quote, creativity, flexibility, and high morale, end quote, were all extremely important. In the Soviet Union, there was fear of a Chinese invasion. As stated by the diplomat and later defector Arkady Shevchenko, quote, the Politburo is terrified that the Chinese might make a mass intrusion into Soviet territory. 
And there were several fears underlying this. One was a genuine fear of a world war. Less than 20 years had passed since the end of the Great Patriotic War, and the scars were still very fresh. Keep in mind that the Soviets weren't worried particularly about the risk of nuclear war, knowing the Chinese arsenal was small and undeveloped, but there was a great concern over the Chinese potential to conduct a never-ending guerrilla war. The straw that broke the proverbial camel's back was the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia, ending the Prague Spring. Now, that may strike some of you as odd, as the Soviet invasion in August of that year ended reforms and reimposed more orthodox communism, but what came of the invasion was the Brezhnev Doctrine, which held that the Soviet Union reserved the right to overthrow a government in any socialist state which diverted from a Marxist-Leninist position. Mao used that as the opportunity to condemn Moscow, while Zhao Enlai followed with a statement that denounced the USSR for imperialism, chauvinism, and fascism, comparing Moscow's action to those of America in Vietnam and Hitler in Czechoslovakia. Provocations on the Sino-Soviet border began to escalate, with widespread agreement among historians that Chinese troops attempted to engage Soviet ones on several occasions. The Soviets, however, were keen to avoid taking the bait. That was until March 2, 1969, when PLA troops ambushed a Soviet patrol, killing 32 men. Another incident took place on March 15, leading to the Chinese occupation of Zhenbao, Domansky Island, which was then quickly retaken by Soviet troops. By March 17, the fighting largely came to an end. This was the same day that Moscow called for an emergency meeting of the Warsaw Pact, looking to condemn Chinese aggression. This didn't work out as expected, however. Romania, which had already been critical of Moscow's intervention to end the Prague Spring the year before, refused to join in the condemnation of China. Keep in mind that Bucharest to this point had closer relations with Beijing than it did with Moscow. The day after that meeting, seen as a diplomatic defeat for Moscow, a meeting of representatives of various international communist parties was held. The Soviet Union called for a condemnation of the Chinese from this wider body, but this time the Romanians were joined by the Spanish, the Austrians, and the Indian Communist parties, among others, in declining to condemn Chinese aggression. Clearly, the schism in the communist camp ran deeper than had been expected. It took until September for Soviet attempts to reach Mao to agree to a ceasefire. And this was only after renewed skirmishing in August along the border along Xinjiang province. Zhao Enlai and Alexei Kosygin began meetings to eventually lead to a resolution on the border dispute. So how was the rest of the world reacting to all of this? Or more specifically, how was the United States reacting? Well, Washington was trying to take advantage of the split between the two communist nations. During the 1969 border conflict, the Nixon administration made several attempts to establish contact with the Chinese government. Keep in mind at this point, the United States didn't formally recognize the PRC, instead seeing Taiwan as the legitimate representative of the Chinese state. Efforts took until 1971, when noted warmonger Henry Kissinger made a trip to Beijing, which paved the way for Nixon's week-long visit to China the following year. Nixon's visit to China began the road to normalizing the relationship between Washington and Beijing and was met with dismay by Moscow. The bipolar world order was shifting, eroding even, as Beijing began to assert itself more forcefully on the world stage. Despite the added complications of three world powers, for the West it was seen as an important triumph to firmly drive the wedge between Moscow and Beijing in order to weaken the Soviet Union. After all, the Sino-Soviet alliance had been seen in the West as the, quote, greatest power to challenge the political supremacy of the Western capitals since the final expansion of the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. That's a quote from the historian Odd Arno Vestat, by the way. Now, how did this wedge manifest itself? Well, we can look at the example of Vietnam. At the start of the American intervention there, both the USSR and the PRC were providing aid, military personnel, and weapons to North Vietnam. However, relations between Hanoi and Beijing were challenging given Vietnamese suspicions over Chinese intentions. When Chinese requests for Hanoi to sever diplomatic relations with Moscow were refused, 
China withdrew its own support for Vietnam, instead shifting its attention and relationship to the Khmer Rouge in neighboring Cambodia. Cambodia even went so far as to use this Chinese support to launch an attack on Vietnam in 1978, which was then responded to by a Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia. Hanoi did this with the support of the Soviet Union. So the two giants of the socialist world were fighting their own proxy war in Southeast Asia. Notably, China was receiving diplomatic support from the United States, who attempted to pass condemnation of Vietnamese actions through the UN. The Soviet Union, however, supported their own ally and vetoed these attempts. China then launched its own invasion of Vietnam in February of 1979, and although the PLA suffered severe casualties, their withdrawal after a month was claimed as a victory for having taught the Vietnamese a lesson. Moscow, fearing an all-out war with China, only provided non-military aid to Vietnam. Beijing was happy to call out Moscow publicly for not having supported their ally. This type of divide, where Moscow and Beijing faced off against each other through proxies, happened in places other than Vietnam as well. The Ogaden War, fought between Ethiopia and Somalia in the late 1970s, saw the Soviet Union back Ethiopia while China provided aid and diplomatic support for Somalia. During the Angolan Civil War, China and the United States found themselves both supporting UNITA, while the Soviet Union and Cuba supported support for the ruling MPLA. It took until the late 1980s for Sino-Soviet relations to begin to really thaw, although the 1980s in general did see less belligerent policies between the two countries. But the Sino-Soviet split goes a long way to demonstrating how complicated Cold War relations really were. We often view the Cold War as a confrontation of West versus East, of capitalism versus socialism. That view is predicated on an assumption that each side was composed of monolithic entities, united together and led by their respective standard bearers of the United States and the Soviet Union. But as we can see, reality is far more complex than that. China played a major independent role in not only East Asia, but also in other parts of the world, including Africa and Europe. It created friction inside the socialist camp, influencing nations like Romania and Albania. And while ideology was important, Mao was no doubt a staunch communist, he was more than ready to heal relations with the United States as a matter of political expediency. The Cold War was more than just a bipolar geopolitical struggle, but rather one of shifting alliances, of fluid relationships. Ideology was important, but could always be sacrificed on the altar of national interest. Now, the reason I'm so excited to be working with Omaze is to offer you the chance to win an Airstream Caravel 20FB and Ford F-150 and support a great cause, the Bob Woodruff Family Foundation. The Airstream Caravel 20FB offers everything you need for off-the-grid luxury living, even a three-burner Baraldi stainless steel stove. Whether you bring family or friends or decide to go solo, the time to start planning your dream Airstream escape is now. Donations support the Bob Woodruff Family Foundation, which ensures that America's impacted veterans, service members, their families, and caregivers have access to the highest level of support and resources they have earned for as long as they need it. Head to www.omaze.com slash the Cold War and enter now. The experience closes on December 30th at 1159 Pacific, and I promise you don't want to miss this. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and to make sure you don't miss our future work, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have arranged for history's greatest monster, Henry Kissinger, to go to that other bell button to pave the way forward so that you yourself can press the bell button. Please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Cold War or through YouTube membership. We can be reached via email at the Cold War channel at gmail.com. This is the Cold War channel. And as we think about the Cold War, please remember that history is shades of gray and rarely black and white.